this is Visidia, the source for inclusive, actionable dialogue on funding and creating a better world. If you're building the future, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Skylar Cole. Before we start the show, I'd like to share that if you're listening to the audio podcast, we're also on YouTube. You can watch this episode there as well as check out video exclusive content. If you're already watching from YouTube, thank you. Today, I am so excited to talk with Lisa Ishii. Lisa is a senior partnership manager at Plug and Play Tech Center, the world's largest early stage investor, accelerator, and corporate innovation platform. They have close to 40 locations around the world, making over 250 investments a year. Bridging startups and corporations to Japan with the rest of the world, Lisa focuses on smart cities, which include mobility, real estate, energy industries, and more. She oversees corporation strategies and supports them in accelerating their innovation activities in the Bay Area, sometimes setting up their innovation roadmaps and providing related industry expertise. Lisa shares valuable insights on multiple facets of engaging with Japanese corporations, exciting events from the past year, and how Japanese young professionals can thrive outside of Japan. Now let's get started. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for your invite, Tyler. I'm excited to be here. So first,、uh, to start, can you just describe your background, how you got into this space? Sure.、Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Lisa, and、uh, I was actually born and raised in Japan. But、um, from 10 to 17, I was in Ohio, Ohio State in the U.S., And、um, then I went back to Japan for college.、Uh, and I've always wanted to kind of come back to the US,、uh, especially the Bay Area, you know, because a lot of things are happening. A lot of the new technologies, new services.、Um, back then, maybe even Uber or Lyft、uh, when it was popular. Now, Japan has those technologies, but、uh, it was always de- several years delayed. And、um, I've always wanted to kind of. See、uh, what kind of people and what it would, ch- how it would change my life if I could move here.、Um, so, actually, first year I was working in banking, but because I was telling a lot of people that I wanted to go to the Bay Area eventually, one of my friends connected me with、uh, this guy who works at my current firm, which is Plug and Play Tech Center.、Uh, it's one of the most active VC in the Bay Area.、Uh, invest- In over 200 startups a year. But、um, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to fly out to California to take this interview. So, prior to my experience now, I had zero background in startups and investment. However, they were looking for、uh, someone who could bridge、um, Japan and Silicon Valley、uh, startups. And、um, I thought that was such an interesting role and opportunity. That it, it was very rare for、um, non engineered background person to be offered that. So I thought about it for a couple months,、um, but I knew that I would regret it if I didn't take this random opportunity. So I decided to fly out、um, about three years ago. So that's how I kind of got into this field. Can you provide an overview of what the relationship is、um, in the tech and startup ecosystem between have Silicon Valley and Japan? Sure.、Um, so there are a lot of aspects, of course, but I would say that、um, it's more of that Jap- Japan's, Jap- Japan's largest、um, corporations, about 900 of them are currently based in the Bay Area, so called Silicon Valley.、Um, A lot of them are looking for new technologies to implement、um, or just to explore this space.、Um, there are a lot of labs that are based here,、uh, like Toyota Research Institute,、um, that are constantly looking for new technologies here.、Um, on the other hand, I think、uh, in terms of startups,、uh, I actually don't come, off, come across too many Japanese startups in this area because I think. Uh, there's a huge language barrier,、uh, maybe physical barrier、uh, for these Japanese entrepreneurs to come here. But、um, there is definitely a certain amount of interest from Silicon Valley and the rest of the world's startups、uh, towards Japan's market.、Uh, because, as we all know, Japan is still the third largest GDP 
and uh, there's a lot of cash there and um, people with technology. So I think it's kind of interesting to be in the middle position where we work with corporations and as well as startups to explore both markets and so forth. I'm wondering since there is um, kind of a, somewhat of a physical barrier uh, between Japan and Silicon Valley, what in a pre-COVID um, world did kind of interactions look like? Sure. Um, actually, pre-COVID era was very, very busy. Um, a lot a lot of corporations and governments, municipalities, different cities, chamber of commerce people would fly to Silicon Valley. And not only the top 100 you know, corporations in Japan, but even the middle and smaller business owners will come here to study what they can do uh, within these you know, um, aging, aging population and kind of shrinking cities uh, within Japan. And so I would host, uh, you know, five or six groups a day uh, and, you know, from like Rakuten CEO to uh, these uh, smaller, you know, city uh, mayors. And so that was very interesting for me. Um, but, you know, of course, since COVID hit, uh, that those visits have been kind of basically stopped, but we still have uh, Zoom, you know, meetings and interactions uh, throughout. I mean, that, that's amazing to hear the breadth of businesses coming to Silicon Valley to learn and, and collaborate. So then can you talk more about plug and play's role in, in the ecosystem? Sure, yeah. Um, plug and play, first, for those who don't know, uh, we f- were founded in 2006. Um, it started from uh, near Stanford, Palo Alto, small office uh, where the CEO actually um, had a rug, Persian rug store. And uh, back then, Google, PayPal, Drop, Dropbox, and Danger, these uh, small startups were based there. It was kind of an incubation hub. Um, and then it's also called the officially lucky building where these startups eventually really, really succeeded. And we were invest, able to invest in most of these companies. So that was the start of our firm. And uh, now, you know, like we invest in over 250 startups a year globally. Uh, mainly in the U.S. and China and Europe, um, and then now a little bit in Japan as well. So, of course, we work as a VC firm. At the same time, the reason I work with a lot of these corporations is because uh, these corporations, um, you know, now in this uh, rapidly changing world, these corporations who have done R&D within internally, are actually actively looking outside you know, so-called maybe open innovation and trying to work together with not only just startups, but different universities, different uh, corporates. And so our role is to kind of, it's a, essentially a platform where whether you're a startup or investor or corporations, because we also work with uh, 350 investors. Um, and so then we kind of connect these players and uh, to essentially uh, promote collaboration uh, among different sectors. And uh, as one of the only two Japanese at the firm uh, in Silicon Valley back then, uh, I would work with a lot of Japanese corporations, like maybe 90 or so across industry to really help them um, find startups that they're looking for could really uh, accelerate their businesses. And so that's kind of how plug and play uh, comes in when, when it comes to the Silicon Valley's uh, in Japan's ecosystem. I mean, that's really interesting to kind of hear about the emphasis uh, on working with corporations. Um, so I think in, in Japan, these large corporations still, you know, dominate so much of kind of business and the economy to see um, the relationships with startups is, I think, a really interesting dynamic. And so you mentioned that there's interest in open innovation. Could you talk a little bit more about what that looks like? Sure, yeah. I think, you know, when, when people say open innovation, there are a lot of different aspects, different ways to touch up, upon it. But I truly be there's, I think that there are three um, key phases when it comes to innovation. So one is, like I said, exposure and exploration phase. Uh, which is a lot of, you know, Japanese companies, what Japanese companies are doing right now uh, when they kind of 
create a research lab or tech hub or people just flying in you know quarterly or even annually to decide their you know midterm management uh, you know scheme and all that um, and I think too the second one would be value creation where then after the exploration phase these companies kind of figure out what kind of startups they might want to work with or they will start working with them meaning uh, maybe signing an NDA, doing a small project together, whether whether it's a POC or a pilot, and kind of test out their technology or solution. Um, and it's a great opportunity for startups to see uh, all the resources that these large corporations have, um, especially the ones in Japan, for example. And uh, when those um, interests match, then of course it goes into implementation or you know cost cutting reduction solution. And um, so then the third part, it comes the transformation and culture, cultural change. So in order to actually fully roll this out, not just within the Bay Area, um, maybe you know, at these large corporations subsidiary or just the, within the US market, but they essentially, the, all of the big decisions will go back to Japan. If that uh, startup or the solution is very good, then they'll take it back to their headquarters and uh, the executives will definitely essentially make this decision and allocate some budget to really roll out full, uh, roll out, roll out fully in Japan. And um, that comes with the mind change in mindset, change in corporate culture. And I think that is really the most important thing when it comes to open innovation and you know, yeah, um, different projects. So uh, as plug and play, then try to kind of uh, you know, do some tailored services for each uh, phases, whether it's through like industry reports or creating a startup list, customized startup list, or even um, doing some webinars and seminars at these headquarters or in front of their executives. Or before COVID, of course, would show them around, uh, the, the CEOs and the executives around so that they understand what it takes to bring these startups and solutions to that phase. Um, but because at the end of the day, exploration won't do anything for the company. So those are the things that I, I do and we do at Plug and Play. And could you talk a little bit more about the cultural aspect since it's so important? And I'm wondering f when you first start working with um, a Japanese corporation, um, kind of what, what is the starting point? Um, and then in addition to that, you have to navigate working in a more uh, Japanese uh, culture and then the startup U.S. culture. Could you also talk about kind of those different dynamics and switching between the two? Yes. <laughs> so thank you for that's a very important and interesting question. Um, I struggle every day, to be honest. But uh, before, prior to coming here, um, I did work in a bank in Japan. So I definitely have an understanding of how these large corporations in Japan work and what their culture is, which is very important because, like you said, they're very different, the startups in the US versus large corporations in Japan. So how do I navigate is, um, you know, a lot of the executives do come visit, like I said, every year, you know, before COVID for sure, um, to explore and they understand the need to change, but they don't really know how because a lot of these people have never left the company or ne never worked outside of Japan. And so um, then what we do is, okay, well, you, you first, you know, what do you want to accomplish, right? What does a goal, like ideal outcome of creating an office here, sourcing startups here look like uh, in your view? You know, and these CEOs and executives usually have three to max maybe five years of their term, which is not necessarily long, uh, very different compared to non-Japanese corporations. And so that comes in a bit tricky. So that is, it's just essential to create those KPIs and goals and align the vision that they have and really articulate uh, and have these so that we can understand and communicate with the startups and our network to really um, match and uh, you know move the balls ball forward. 
So then after we kind of get the corporate side on board, um, what kind of business unit, who's going to be in charge, you know, how many people you're going to have and what will be their budgets, you know, and, um, you know, what's the minimum KPI you need to meet and so forth. Then we, of course, um, source from all over the world, 37 locations we have outside um, and to gather the best startups in the world for that company or for that strategy. And but what we definitely need to communicate with the startup then is to have them understand that Japanese companies will have to take a bit long time uh, just because of these internal processes and kind of ambiguous um, steps when making these decisions. But once they do uh, make these decisions, they're very loyal, they're very uh, supportive. And so my role, our role is to really try to smoothen out that communication so that there's no misunderstanding and uh, mismatched expectations because that's, that's the biggest and the trickiest you know, uh, barrier when it comes to collaboration between corporate and startups. So um, I think just trying to onboard them both sides and really try to be there um, when it comes to communication and these, setting these timelines is a very important thing. What uh, projects or uh, verticals have you been in recently or working in that are interesting uh, that, you, that you can share? Sure. Um, so I actually work under the Smart Cities vertical at Plug and Play which kind of covers mobility space, um, connected things, energy, and um, real estate and construction space. So um, I've been here for almost three years, but most recently this year, um, this company called Koito, um, which is a tier one supplier based in Japan, actually holds the number one share of headlights uh, in the world. And they're definitely not the most, you know, um, cutting edge, you know, technology kind of, uh, company, you know, they actually hit um, 100th year uh, several years ago. So they're pretty traditional manufacturer, but they actually successfully made um, $50 mil million dollar investment to this startup called Sepon Technologies, actually based in San Jose in the Bay Area, um, which was kind of very uh, a highlight, very much a highlight of my working experience um, personally. Because one, because Koito actually has a large plant in my hometown, Shizuoka. Uh, and also to see a Bay Area startup, a local startup based in San Jose, um, you know, kind of that series C round was led by a Japanese company based in Japan. It's something that probably would never happen without our platform or outside of our network. And to kind of see that actually happen after their innovation initiatives for the past five years or so was, was very inspiring. And um, it made me, it was kind of like uh, definitely one of the high highlights of this year. I think it's incredible, like you said, it's really inspiring to see this older uh, business, Japanese, traditional Japanese business, being in the space and being kind of on this cutting edge and leading the, the, the Series C. And even though we're in a world of, lots of innovation and startups and moving fast and breaking things. I guess we're still doing that. Um, that there's still a place for older, more traditional businesses. And it's amazing to see kind of how that dynamics can play out um, and, and there can be um, synergy. So can you talk a little bit more about how uh, the round came together? Sure. Yeah, I think it was definitely a rare case um, because there are a lot of financial companies or insurance companies, you know, which technically has a bit more, generally has a bit more cash uh, to play around with. But uh, these manufacturers don't have such a big, you know, profit margin or especially when it comes to this COVID times. Um, and for them to really make, uh, take action on this $50 million investment was a huge deal. So how it happened was that um, they kind of met the startup Septon uh, through our network, and they also are very active in the Bay Area. Actually, a lot of the Japanese companies, or not only Japanese, but in general, the companies are more used to being receptive, you know, in their home country, because they're big players, right? And then they're used to having uh, clients come to them. 
But the different factor here in the Bay Area is that startups are not waiting or not asking corporations to work with them. So the corporations actually have to be very active as in uh, articulate about what they want to accomplish, what they can offer to these startups. What Koito did that was amazing was that they would host these um, only technical, very techie people, like people from Waymo, you know, autonomous uh, vehicles or even NVIDIA and all these, um, you know, uh, kind of major companies in the Bay Area as well to host a sensor fusion meetup every month, every month, uh, no excuses, every month they continued for three years, the network uh, amount of engineers that they got to um, put in, be in contact with grew tremendously. And so through that also they met Septon and they kind of had them talk and uh, actually they released their work to collaboration at CES in Las Vegas, which is one of the largest conferences, um, tech conferences in the world. And then from then on their R&D team and Septon startup have been uh, researching together, kind of co-developing the sensors in this headlight space. Because again, when the vehicles become fully autonomous or not even fully, but um, needs these sensors and uh, in order to you know, make enable those technologies to come into reality, uh, their headlight make, you know, maker manufacturer needed the technology that will enable that and kind of make up for their uh, weak points. And so then that really went well. I know the startup flew to Japan multiple times, really talked with headquarters researchers. They could talk, talk um, and understand in their very techy terms uh, and communication ways. And then that, then uh, the Septon technology came to a phase where they were uh, raising for another round. And with that uh, kind of came in the right timing, the Koito executives and board members decided that it was right decision for them to make that investment and lead that round so that Koito can essentially um, have these, you know, non-exclusive uh, deal to manufacture and sell you know, sell their uh, their septon lidar sensors. So that was kind of how the story went, and uh, yeah, it's very impressive. I would love to see more companies do a similar thing here. Awesome. So I mean, that's an incredible story, and I'm wondering what you would like to see to uh, push for more Japanese engagement collaboration um, in the Bay, of course. It start Silicon Valley and startups. Uh, U.S. startups coming to Japan, just kind of overall, what, what would you like to see moving forward? So, yes, thank you. Um, I would love to see more interactions in general. So I think one aspect is Japan has very strict policy when it comes to kind of immigrants and all that. And I believe you're based in Japan right now, but it's probably not easy when you are looking for jobs after this or, you know, for anyone that's based outside of Japan to come to the Japanese market. Uh, because I, in my eyes, um, Japanese government and corporations and universities even are not necessarily putting so much effort into bringing outside talents to Japan. That is one issue that I would love to see kind of change or, you know, uh, in the coming years. The other aspect is that, you know, this is my 10th year in the U.S. However, it's rarely the case that I run into Japanese people. Uh, and you know, it, the community and the people who work outside of Japan is very, very limited compared to um, countries like China, you know, Korea, even like Indonesia these days. And uh, I think Japan, uh, given its presence and given its, you know, um, third GDP and the huge middle class and, you know, very highly educated people, I think it's just such a lost opportunity for these people to kind of remain in Japan and be comfortable in Japan. You know, don't get me wrong, I love Japan. I think I agree, you know, that Japan is one of the best countries to be in. However, if you are still, you know, in your 20s, 30s, building up this career, and really, especially these days, um, you really don't know where things are gonna go. And I think if you only know, this is not just limited to Japan, but if you only know or have experience in one region or one sector, your world definitely naturally become narrow and smaller. And it's almost impossible to grasp uh, these changes and feel 
the sense of these new waves coming uh, if you have your head down, you know? And so I think uh, my advice and what I would love to see is, you know, for Japan and Jap people in Japan to really understand and try to, you know, be curious and open-minded about these uh, potential changes in where you live, where you work, what you do um, in your day-to-day -day life so that as a whole, Japan will be more open and innovative country. Uh, and that will definitely, you know, make a huge uh, impact change, positive impact going forward. So I hope um, that that will come into reality in the near future. Hey everyone, I want to take a moment to thank you for listening to Vcedia. I'm excited to connect with others hungry to build a better future. If you share the vision, I'd love to hear from you. For guest and partnership inquiries, send an email to hello at vcedia.com or DM on Twitter at the underscore vcedia. Also, please leave Vcedia a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It would really help. Now back to our conversation. Um, in addition to these overall um, changes you like to see in uh, Japanese engagement uh, outside of Japan, um, mm -hmm. are there things in your workplace, in your line of work that you would, would like to see? Yeah, so I think it's also especially true for my uh, vertical, my sector, uh, smart cities. There are not many female founders at all. Um, you know, I've seen maybe eight exposed demo days or more uh, now, but it's rarely the case that I run into female founders, uh, especially in automotive space, you could probably imagine in manufacturing space. And uh, I just, you know, actually as plug and play as well, I, we started this initiative called Found Her, where we um, host extra workshops and networking sessions. Um, and now during COVID, uh, everything has gone virtual. So we actually do it worldwide. Um, every last Friday, we host this workshop and uh, definitely try to kind of create this community um, for these minorities uh, founders. And uh, one of the new program that we launched this year in Detroit is uh, also interesting because um, the startups that we select into the batch and accelerate and you know help with the mentoring, the investment, and uh, business development. About over forty percent of that cohort has to be minority founders. So this has been like a rule now there, which is a very big step towards pushing these minorities and uh, female founders to really you know be under the spotlight, um, which hopefully will definitely give positive impact overall in our societies. And I would love to see more change and uh, push this to Japan as well. I think in Asia is a bit more um, larger gap compared to you know, Nordic countries or even in the Bay Area. So um, that's, that's what I would love to see as well. Wow, that's, that's really exciting. In addition to your uh, work, with Japanese corporations uh, and collaborations. Are there other areas uh, or geographies that you work in? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I personally was always interested in China. Um, and even with COVID, we all saw how China's Chinese government and their technology was able to play a big role and impact uh, in saving millions of lives. Um, and I think that actually last year, pre-COVID, but um, I organized this uh, Shenzhen deep dive. So Shenzhen, for those who've never kind of heard of, it's called Shenzhen in Japanese, but um, it's called Silic uh, Silicon Valley of China. So um, a lot of new technologies, a lot of innovative policies and the collaborations between the government and these startups and uh, foreign you know, investments kind of come together in that hub near Hong Kong. And so um, I actually, you know, asked several of Japanese companies if they would be interested in going there. And so we ended up taking about 12 Japanese corporations from Japan and also from Bay Area as well to organize this kind of like a study tour, but uh, leveraging our office and resources in China because we actually have over 100 employees in China, uh, in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and all other places. So we visited like companies like Tencent and Alibaba and, you know, really saw these large technology companies as well as 
startups um, that are in the area. And uh, what's interesting about it was um, average age of Shenzhen actually is 32 or so compared to like 40, late 40s or mid 40s in Tokyo. So there was a huge difference there. And um, I think it was very inspiring for Japanese executives and uh, managers to see um, that, you know, countries right next to us is being so innovative. And, you know, these young people, younger generations are running uh, or leading this space. And so um, even then, after that, uh, several of these companies actually started a CBC, like Asahikase started a CBC in China, um, or, you know, Takenaka, uh, largest, one of the largest construction companies um, started looking into, you know, China in deeper in terms of technologies. So I think those are very exciting, um, you know, factors for me and, it's, it really drives me uh, you know, motivated every day to work and always um, try and see and come up with new ways how we can help these um, you know, Japanese companies uh, see and expose themselves to different locations and different cultures around the world. That's so awesome. And it's, it's really awesome to see uh, your joy and your commitment in your work. Um, <laughs> yes, it's very, very fun. Um, very rewarding, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, more than anything. Oh, it so. definitely sounds like it. Okay, awesome. So speaking of joy, and <laughs> we are in the part of our show, Geek Out, where guests get a minute or two to geek out or nerd out about something that they enjoy completely separate from work. Um, could be something you want to do if you had more time to do it uh, or, or something you're able to do uh, on a regular basis. So if you would, Lisa geek out yeah my geek out okay well i love traveling and of course it has been the toughest time since march because i haven't been really able to do it but um you know i whenever i get a chance whether it's a business trip or uh, on my personal you know leisure time i been to maybe 45 countries around six, six continents i have yet to go to antarctica unfortunately but um i would backpack and really see the culture and meet the people um, because I truly believe that your world is made up of your experiences, whether it's the people that you meet, places that you live, the things that you eat. Um, and that really creates your sense of the world. And I love it when that when my world kind of expands little by little. So yeah, I would love to, I mean, I hope traveling industry will come back and we'll be able to travel again but that's something that I love doing. So I know you mentioned Antarctica, but what, what's the, when we're able to travel safely again, what's top on your list uh, for a place to visit? Oh, <laughs> that's a hard one. There's so many. <laughs> right, same. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would love to, I think, visit um, Estonia, for mm -hmm. example, or Russia. Mm -hmm. What Estonia, because uh, maybe, a lot of you know that Estonia is one of the uh, tech-led government, and they actually, you can be, anyone can be a citizen of Estonia actually these days, and you all you need is just like 10 minutes, 15 minutes online, you go to their website. But I think it's just very impressive how a small country like them were able to really um, bring that country together and then drive this digitalization. I would love to kind of see and hear that uh, on the ground uh, for Russia, because it's such a big country and I have a scratch map uh, on my wall and without scratching Russia, it's just, my map feels not really travel fully traveled. <laughs> and, you know, I, I am just curious how they, how the people are generally speaking and, um, my background and I got my education in the U S so I would love to kind of learn, uh, about the culture and the people in Russia um, as well. Okay, yeah. when you go to Estonia and Russia, I want to tag along. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's on you, then it'll happen. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome, we'll figure it out. <laughs> awesome, so thank you so much for joining me today. This has been so much fun. Of course, it has been a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for all your fantastic questions. Thank you for listening to this episode. You can subscribe on your podcast platform of choice and check us out on YouTube. If you're interested in being featured, or know someone who should, 
send us an email at hello at the cd.com. Also, connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore Visidia for more from our guests, Visidia, and the future of inclusive investment and innovation ecosystems. You can also follow me on Twitter at Skylar Cole. Until next time.